Hey, everybody. I was lucky enough to talk to Tom House, legendary pitching coach, pitching coach of greats such as Nolan Ryan and Randy Johnson, and even working with Tom Brady and Drew Brees about this sticky substance issue um, and the history of it and what the various effects of using sticky substances would be. So before we get into this interview, if you can do me a favor and hit that subscribe button, you're not going to want to miss all the latest shows, shorts, and interviews. Um, so do it. You're really doing yourself a favor by doing that. Um, but you're also doing me a favor. So hit the subscribe button. And without further ado, here is Tom House. What is happening, Tom? Not much, Rob. Being on your show is the highlight of my life, buddy. Here we go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pressure's on. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, great. Now I'm going to mess up. Well, we are here to talk about foreign substances as something near and dear to every pitcher's heart. Um, obviously a big topic in today's game, um, but it's been around for forever. So I want to kind of explore that, get your take on it as someone that may or may not have done stuff to the ball. You can tell me, I won't tell anybody except the folks that watch this. Okay. Sounds good to me. Full okay. disclosure. Awesome. So um, my experience, so, so based on what I know and people I've talked to is it's not a, it's not a new problem. People have been loading up baseballs, using sandpaper, using a whole bunch of things since baseball has been baseball. It's like one of those gamesmanship cheating type thing, but it's not been something that is like, it's not criminalized. It's not against federal law. It's not, it, it's a, it's, it's kind of a different area, grayish area. Um, and that pitchers use it to get an edge. What has your, been your experience on that? Well, what I've seen over 50 years of pro ball and obviously being around older generation pitchers than me, um, if you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. And you said it best, everybody's looking for an edge. Hitters are looking for an edge, you know, corking bats and knob loading and boning the bat. And you're, you're always looking for something, whether it turns out to be a placebo or not, it's looking for an edge. And what people don't realize is that unless you can throw strikes, cheating doesn't work. I mean, I could take a, a, an 18 year old Dominican kid that can throw the ball 100 miles an hour, um, give him sticky goo, whatever they call it today, or tell him how to put dirt in the scene or, you know, a slippery elm, and he couldn't get the ball close. So it's part of the art form that is pitching. And you don't cheat on every pitch. You only cheat when you have to. And it's always nice to have something in your bag of tricks to get you out of a tough spot. So I kind of look at today's what's going on with whatever they're calling the substance that they're using to get better spin rates. That's, I think it's great theater. It's no big deal. It's really no big deal. That's interesting because the way, so my take on it is, it, it was always kind of an art form. Like people would know it when they saw it. They'd be like, I'll try this, I'll try that. I'll use a little Vaseline, Gaylord Perry type stuff. Um, Pedro said he used Jerry Curl. Nolan said he wasn't opposed to using pine tar to help his curveball in some situations. And now with all the measurement technologies that we have, we can actually optimize that. We can know like how much spin this, is, this, this substance is doing versus the other substances and where it should be exactly and all that stuff. But it's not, it's not turning over new rocks. It's actually just perfecting what others had previously done as an art form. Now it's been a science. Is that fair? You're exactly, you're dead on. The, the science of today's game, the fact that we can actually have capture at a thousand frames a second and foot pounds of energy and spin right and release point, distance the ball traveled and you know, the lateness of a break, all that stuff just makes what we had to figure out intuitively in the good old days. And, but it's, it's information overload. The, the guys from my generation, I don't know if you remember the name, Sid Fernandez. Of course. He was, yeah. a, he was a power pitcher and never threw harder than 88 miles an hour, but he had high spin rate and a huge curveball. Henry Aaron talked about Sandy Koufax is he, you had to make up your mind with him when the ball was halfway to home plate because it either did this 
or this. So in, in today's game, in my opinion, spin rate is awesome. But the problem with spin rate and the issue is where people are getting hit. You got athletes that can't control it. The higher strike zone, it, I'll just cut right to the chase. If I was king of the baseball world, I would literally lower the strike, zap, the strike zone eight inches, just drop the whole thing down eight inches and lower the mound eight inches. And that would even everything out, point blank. You wouldn't, the, the velocities these kids are able to achieve now is one of the reasons that hitters are having trouble. But if you flat, flatten the mound by eight inches, it's harder to throw with velocity the flatter the mound is. So flatten the mound, lower the strike some, and we're all back to neutral. Interesting. So in your experience, what, what like back in the day, how, what percentage of pitchers did something? Um, it would be easier to say what percentage of pitchers didn't do something. You, you know, you mentioned a few. You, you could, like, I'm, I'm not going to lie. You look at, look at my numbers in Dodger Stadium. They're clay mound. If you've got a little clay on, on a finger and you put it in a seam, you, wherever the seam was uh, with the clay in it, the ball would go the opposite, dire opposite direction. So I had huge numbers in Dodger Stadium because someone showed me what to do with clay. You mentioned Gaylord Perry with a spitball. You know, it, it wasn't a, a, a spitball per se. It was something gooey. And this was all a show and the potter on the wrist was a show. You get it between your legs from the back of your thumb, then you touch it. Because there isn't an umpire alive that's gonna come out and check between your legs. No, I'm, I'm serious. And the sandpaper thing, um, and you talk about cutting the ball next to the seam or your catcher would cut it for you. There's a thousand quote, quote stories about how pitchers manipulated the ball with something extra. It's part of the game. It will always be part of the game. But I'll go back to what I originally said, Rob, and I'm, I'm so glad you brought it up. You just can't cheat and win. You have, it's, it's an extension of your skill level. All right, and if, if people would understand that, that, and here's another thing that, that I don't know if you've ever seen it or heard it, but the, the unspoken rules of the game, if you have to fiddle a little bit to keep your job, everybody's okay with that. But if you're throwing, like if Jake DeGrom was to, was to start doctoring the ball and fiddling, they, they would run him out of the league because he doesn't need it to make a living. But a guy like me, having to pitch backwards, having to survive with an 82 mile an hour fastball, um, as long as I didn't abuse it, they left me alone. Do you think that that's part of the problem that we're seeing is that guys like, I mean, and I'm not going to throw it like if Garrett Cole's did or didn't do it, he's still throwing hundred miles an hour. He's still nasty as can be, but to then have that extra edge makes it almost unfair to hit. Is that what you're saying? That that's, that's like the unwritten rule that you can't be that good. Well, and I don't even blame him. I saw his interview and the pregnant silence when he was asked the question. And he's been put in an odd situation because it's, it's right now, it's not illegal. I, I mean, literally you can tacky up your fingers with rosin and it's accepted to use rosin and sunscreen. I mean, you know, and pine tar, everybody said, oh, that's okay, but not this magic new stuff. And, and all the magic new stuff is, is a different way to be sticky. It's no big deal. It's more safer that way than a spitball or a saliva ball or whatever, because literally those pitches actually got away from it. I think the reason was it Pinky May way back, I'm just enough cobwebs. <laughs> yeah. I, think, I think he actually killed the guy throwing a spitball. And that was the beginning of no foreign substances on a ball way you back in the 20s or 30s. You touched on an, an, an excellent subject, and this is something that I've been bringing up, is originally the rule was put in place because, for a variety of different reasons. One is they felt like a spitball was unsanitary. No one wanted to pick up a ball that someone spit on. I asked disgusting. Right. Um, then discoloring the ball, somebody putting something on the ball where it was darker, they used to use fewer balls. 
and you couldn't pick it up. And then it, that combined with unusual movement, you might get hit in the head and killed. Um, it was always more about defacing the ball and doing something to the ball. Even sandpaper or, or screwing with the ball itself was more of the issue than right. nobody focused on spin rate. It wasn't a spin rate driven thing because everybody said that actually sticky stuff made higher command, which is kind of the opposite of why the rule was put in place, right? You're, you're exactly right. And they're looking for a reason for the fact that hitters are striking out too much. Pitchers have this obscene velocity. You know, I, I couldn't even play in high school ball right now if, if I was in the middle of my teens. Kids are throwing harder. So yay for technology and strength and all the good stuff that the science has brought to baseball. But I think you're trying to punish a symptom, not cure the illness. The problems that they're having with spin rate and more movement is the strike zone has been extended higher and literally pit, hitters don't have time to get out of the way. They do not have time to get out of the way. The science shows that there's three pieces to making contact. You, you have to be able to recognize the pitch. You have to decide if you're going to swing and you have to, you have to predict where the ball is going to go. And there's a certain amount of time. And if in that time frame you guess wrong, with high spin rate and a high strike zone, the ball actually chases you. It takes off into your head. And there's no pitcher out there that's trying to hurt anybody. And um, again, it makes for great theater. But I think, from my opinion, I'm old and I you know, have a tendency to look back and simplify things. If they just dropped the strike zone down eight inches and lowered the mound eight inches, it levels the whole playing field for me. But these hard-throwing that, kids that come in and are effectively wild. I'm gonna put a little pressure on you. What is it? Uh, Mitch Williams was the best example I could think of in my generation as a coach, where you had a kid that was effectively wild. What, what, what do you think it is? If, if I was to ask you to define effectively wild, what would you do, Rob? Oh, I think it's, oh. it's, it's a matter of self-preservation. Like you may get hit in the, you may get where yeah. one or the ball may end up over the plate. So you're making a decision later because you're worried about your own. Perfect. Life. I, I give you a little gallery. The, the fear factor. Uh, remember John Crook against Randy Johnson in the all-star game. Yep. Randy Johnson could paint two sliders on the half shell and throw a fastball behind your head without even knowing what he was doing. So it, there's, there's a fear factor involved and what goes on now with hitters who are committed to covering the strike zone, they're going to get a good swing in no matter what. And hitting is a guess. Whether, whether, don't have anybody tell you any different. And they're sitting down the way, and one of these young hard throwers with great spin rate, a ball gets away from him, and it's up and in. You, the, the hitters do not have the time with the increase in velocity and the expansion of the strike zone up, they do not have the time to get out of the way and protect themselves around their face. That's one thing that bothers me the most. But it's all, it's all gonna get done, they're gonna figure it out. The game continues to be special. It's just who's getting blamed for what and why. I think that is a great point. So what I've seen is, it, at least on social media, there are a bunch of, people that are, number one, there are these internet sleuths that are trying to figure out, oh, this pitcher's doing this, that, and the wrong people are getting blamed a little bit. I had Blake Trinan, who is just nasty, and he said, this is God-given, I, and he is a, he is as honest as can be when he says it. It actually kind of offends him a tiny bit being accused, because he's like, this is a gift I've been given. I would never do anything like that. Yeah. Um, and, and then there are other folks that are just looking for, Bauer came about it like, he has been complaining about this for a while and then was more like, hey, there's no cops around. They're saying they're not going to police this road. So I'm going to go fast, too, rather than be left behind. Um, and, and, and I, that's, I agree with that. Yeah, there, there's no reason until they say you can. There, there's no reason for you not to try. And 
people try and it doesn't work. I mean, I'm on record, you know, I, I tried steroids way back when they first started. I didn't throw any better on steroids than I did without them. So that was an experiment that didn't work for me. So, and I'm sure there's guys out there that have great spin rate without even knowing why they have great spin rate. And then there's guys whose spin rate is improved because they have a way to, to improve it. Why not take advantage of it? Right, and it, it, it's not like it makes you throw faster. It doesn't nope. add, it's not adding an ungodly amount. You're not all of a sudden gonna be throwing blitz balls where before you weren't. You're perfecting it. You're adding a few, a, a few hundred RPMs to something, which obviously is giving a pitcher an advantage. I would never claim that it doesn't. As long as it's a level, for me, as long as it's a level playing field, if you're gonna enforce it, enforce it. If it's a rule on the book and you wanna enforce it, enforce it, make it clear, have cameras that watch folks. I don't care what it is. It shouldn't be that the people that want to follow the rules, the rule followers are penalized and the people that are willing to break them aren't and they get an advantage. It should be an even playing field, whatever it is. Whatever you're, you're, you're exactly right. And when the weighted balls started coming out, different companies were selling different. The, the program itself was pretty solid. How many pitchers are there out there that, oh, I don't want to do the weighted balls because it's just not right. Well, it, it, it is right. And if you don't do it, you're not using your noggin. It's not telling you that you can't give it a try and see what happens. I, I think that there's a lot of things and, and you were at the very forefront of this. Um, so, so you're guilty of it. Uh, but, but I'm saying oh, like, yeah. no, I'm saying like science. I'm saying like science, like bringing science to pitching has made pitching so much better that it's hitters have to catch up hitters. I always view pitching as offense. So when people say offense is down, I'm like, offense isn't down. Pitcher has the ball. I'm on offense. The hitters counter punching. So the offense has gotten better and it's through technology and everything. Now hitters have to counter punch and counter it, but you were starting this thing. Like you were the grandfather of bringing technology into the game. Well, I thank you for remembering that, but I still, to this day, called it the art and science of pitching. Pitching beats hitting, statistically, no matter what's going on. Numbers say that the, the Hall of Fame pitchers are gonna fail half the time. Hall of Fame hitters are gonna fail 70% of the time. So pitching is gonna be hitting. But if you can improve your chances with your process, having a good process for a little bit better outcome, and you don't take advantage of it, you're being stupid. So what were the reactions back in the day? So hitters knew, your hitters on your team certainly knew that you were doing stuff to the ball. Like they would, what did they think? Like, were they sitting there going, I got this guy on my side, he's crafty and he's doing all this stuff, it's kind of fun? Or were they saying, you know, Tom, you shouldn't be doing that? Well, I'll tell you what, in my generation, even, even if your best friend was hanging out with you. You didn't talk about me personally cheating. It wasn't something that was broadcast and it wasn't something that was, it was uh, bragged about. But when, like I, when I first learned about a screwball might make my fastball look better, I went right to the source with a guy named Jim Brewer with the Dodgers. I walked right up to him and I said, can you help me with my screwball? And he said, well, I don't know why I should help you, but what do you know about a screw? I said, absolutely nothing. Come on out, kid. I'll show you a couple of things. And then when I was with the Braves, Phil Necro took me aside and said, you might think about pitching backwards. I said, what do you mean pitching backwards? And then I won't bring up a name, but he was a salty vet. And he said, you may want to get a little bit more movement. In those days when Spalding was still the official baseball of, of the National League, um, you would get a ball that had been hit on the ground, one hop the catcher. And he said, whenever you get a ball that has a scuff, if, if there's a scuff on the ball, put it the opposite way you want it to go. And I said, okay. And all of a sudden I ended up with, when I got the ball, and then I, I said, well, what would happen if we created our own scuff? And I went around looking and nobody said, nobody would pay any attention to me, but I did find a guy that said, yeah, here's how you scuff and what you do, but be careful because, and then don't tell anybody. 
but I can honestly say in an almost a nine year big league career, um, I usually let the environment determine what was going on with the ball. And like a, a hot, cold, sweaty day, you could throw a spitball with, without any Vaseline. I remember in Boston when it was so cold, you couldn't even feel your fingers. If you would put a little pine tar in the heel of your glove and just tackied up your thumb, just a notch, you could throw a dry spitter. Those are the kind of things that you learn through experience that kids today, you know, they don't pay any attention to those old goats. But what they're doing is just using better science, better information, better instruction, and better training to come up with better ways to make the ball move. So it's almost like we're penalizing people for being too smart, like for getting that good. Well, and remember, the people that are complaining are the ones that are either failing or they can't do it. Right. Yeah, that's it. Let me throw this at you and you can check out because I know you talk to more people than I do. Um, what do you know about um, why, why, does, why does a hitter want to whatever cork a bat? Do you have any idea? Why do they want to? They assume that yeah. it has something to do with either uh, elasticity of the barrel, so compression of it, or it maybe makes You're, the end a little lighter too. That's close, but it has to do with moments of inertia. The, the, it's, you know, the trampoline effect, you're good, you, you know your science, but it, it also has to do with bat speed. Well, when they took away in the metal bats, they, they took that away. Um, what happened then is they started to knob load. Jack Nicholas did it with his golf clubs. When you put weight in, in, your, in your hands or below your hands, look at Sammy Sosa when he was with the Cubs, that huge uh, knob that he had underneath. What that does is it gives you bat weight, all right? But it also allows you to have bat speed because the swing weight is less when you're knob loaded. The moments of inertia is why guys choke up on a bat. So if you think about Barry Bonds, he, he, he swung, I think, a 32, 34. Look at that, it's right on the plate with a real short bat. The moments of inertia on a short, thick bat, he's got bat speed and the way the bat and the swing weight because of moments of inertia, allow him to have bat speed through the zone. So hitters fill with it too. I, I, and I think that's an important part is like this, all this gamesmanship, it's more in the, it, it falls more in the realm of gamesmanship to me than it does. Like, look, I look at famous movies. You have Naked Gun where, where Leslie Nielsen goes out to the mound and what does he find on the pitcher? Like sandpaper, drills, all this Vaseline. <laughs> like yeah. that's, it's part of the lore of baseball. Yeah, and it's great theater. I don't know if you remember Joe Necro. He, I think he was pitching in Toronto, the, and he pulled it out. But people think he was doctoring the ball. It was for his fingernails. Knuckleballers are always trying to make their fingernails because it's not a knuckleball, it's a fingernail ball. Yep. So he wasn't cheating with that sandpaper, but he had it in his pocket. And to this day, people think he was putting sandpaper on the ball. See, it, you should have been the guy that got caught with the sandpaper. With without a doubt, and <laughs> I never had I never had a like a, a nail file, but I had a little quarter inch round of Ace Hardware grade nine that was hidden somewhere that if you needed a little scuff you could find it. So Dallas Braden asked this question. I think it's a pretty good one. Um, is there any so say the ball sticks to your hand a tiny bit more? Does that put any extra stress on the arm? I haven't thought about that. Or does it torque it more than it normally would? Because the same weight, but a little bit more stickiness to it. I don't know. No, it, it doesn't. The pitching is angular velocity and linear, linear velocity working cotangently to enable you to impart the most force or spin through the center of gravity of the ball over the shortest distance. So. What, what I think is causing injuries is not the fact that they have higher spin rate, but because they're throwing harder and they haven't adapted their decelerators to handle and accommodate the workloads throwing harder. And, and the, the organizations that are 
counting pitches one time through the lineup and not letting kids go deep, that's the one way they can manage um, the adaptation until the kids can. We know, I think I've shared this with you before, we know the human arm can go 118 miles an hour because we did it. I, I've had 10, 12 kids throw a two ounce ball, 118 miles an hour. I know the arm can go that fast. But what we don't know, can the arm do that with large pitch totals over the course of time? So the adaptation to the 118 may never happen because I don't know if anybody will be patient enough to put up with a kid while his arm learns how to do that. Did that make sense? A hundred percent made sense. And I think that that's, that's a whole different area of, of discussion, but I agree with you in that you can almost careful, be too careful with somebody that they become more and more fragile because their body never adapts and right. then hurt them because say you're doing all this strength and conditioning stuff. So your engine is bigger, but your decelerators are not necessarily bigger Perfect. and you've never adapted. And then you yeah, actually can create more injuries. Yeah. That again, you nailed it. That's the big break theory. We're, we're teaching kids how to accelerate their arm at X, but we're not preparing them to decelerate their arm. But spin rate is not what's going to hurt a kid. Gotcha. Okay. And, and I think that's been proven by like uh, scientific studies that say that a curveball is not really any more dangerous than actually a fastball is more dangerous because your body has, I mean, you're, you're going max effort. And putting yeah. in most most uh, thrown thrown there. properly thrown properly a curveball is actually the, the easiest pitch on the arm. We, we I think it was called the modus modus fast or whatever, yep. mo, what, what? the modus sleeve yeah modus sleeve yep modus sleeve when we tested it with the NPA the curveball was actually the easiest pitch on the arm when thrown properly. Now even uh, we'll go into that. I want to. I, I think this is a good other topic. Um, but I wonder even thrown improperly how much more, if it's still slightly less than, like what is proper, because so many kids define, they self-define it. And I think a study I saw, actually a few studies said, even the self-defined kids curveball. So I say, I'm throwing a curveball. Nobody's, you know, measured it and said, you got to do this, or you got to pronate out. It was none of that. Just the kids saying it, they were still, that wasn't a factor in getting hurt. Now, properly thrown is going to be better than not properly thrown. But sure. I think, yeah. I, ideally, perfect mechanics makes all pitches <laughs> more efficient. Exactly. But the only the only pitch when we tested, and we tested for about three straight years, the only pitch I would not let a youth pitcher throw would be a cutter. A cutter is a grown man pitch, and it requires fastball arm speed with a little bit of a breaking ball angle, and that is thrown improperly or thrown too much is really hard on that, especially the elbow. So your overall take on this, on this subject, so we'll, we'll, we'll kind of sum it up, is okay. that, is that uh, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but what I'm hearing is foreign substances. One, it's been done since baseball was baseball. And will um, continue to be forever. And, and we're always going to be experimenting with different things. Is it a scuff yeah. on the ball that happened to happen? Is it a scuff on the ball that maybe I created? Is it dirt? Is dirt a foreign, is dirt even a foreign substance? Ag agreed. And right now what I'm seeing is pine tar a bad substance. Now, everybody's saying, well, it may not be so bad to have pine tar now, now that we have super stick. The other thing, right. And the, so the other thing, and this is me being, this is my lawyer part coming out. Okay. The rules say, you can't even apply rosin to the ball. It's a, so right. we're we are clearly like they want the puff or whatever it is. You can't apply rosin to the ball. You can apply rosin to your hands. You can't apply rosin to the ball. All the rules seem to be focused on things like defacing the ball, discoloring right. the ball, putting puffy stuff on the ball, putting spit on the ball. If you're putting sticky stuff on your hand and not intentionally putting it on the ball, is that actually even the intent of the rule to begin with? Or are we now just reading stuff into the rule that wasn't really there? Well, you're the, you're the lawyer, you're the arbitrator. I'll count on you for that. <laughs> but I will tell you this, um, it's an art form. 
And I, I think the theater is awesome to get people, oh, they're doing this and they're doing that. You know, it's on TV and all the pundits are, and all the announcers are talking about it. That's good for the game. And there's heroes and there's villains. But the bottom line is pitching is pitching. The guys that are going to get people out because they're good and skilled are going to get people out. Everybody else is just trying. And you wouldn't say you wouldn't consider any of today's pitchers that are doing any of this stuff to be villains. No, I think until they're told they specifically cannot, they're trying, they're trying to make a living and get better any way they possibly can, any edge. And, you know, look at any, any occupation out there, there are tricks of the trade. And you, you are going to take advantage of whatever ones you can until you're told you can't. Do you so, feel, in, 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 to flip it, are you actually doing your team a disservice by not doing what other players are doing if they're successful in doing that? If you're saying, no, I don't want to do that, and it's not even a health risk. Yeah, it's a personal choice. I, and I never get on people or their belief system, period, point blank. But I do tell them to their face, if you give me an option on a way to make myself better, that may not be exactly legal, but it's not illegal. I'm on it like white on rice. That's just my personality. But when you tell me I, when you tell me I can't, I'll play by those rules too. So you would have made a great lawyer because that is literally what everybody's trained to do is go right to the edge and figure out where the hard line is. You don't want ever to get your client in trouble but you want your client to take advantage of every possible thing that will not get them in trouble. Yeah, when you go to bed at night, and I don't know if you're anything like me, Rob, when I go to bed at night, I ask, did I do everything today to be the best I could be for the people that I care about? And if I say yes to myself, I sleep really good. If not, I say, when I get up tomorrow, I'm gonna, I'm gonna work on this. And that's why what you and I are talking about right now, I just wish, everybody could get the same input that you and I are having because there's no right or wrong. There is a good and bad for the individual involved and that individual in his homeostatic environment called baseball. Yeah. And and, well, one other point very quickly I want to touch on is people are saying, well, the stickier, the stuff, the better. There's a point theoretically where it's too sticky to even get off your hand. Like if I use super glue, and, and try to throw a baseball and it's stuck to my hand, that is not very effective. So it has to be the right substance that you're even talking about. Remember, there has to be enough that you can throw a strike. And here's how fine it is. For every one eighth of an inch that your middle finger misses middle of baseball at release point, it's eight inches at home plate. So if you're this far off with your middle finger, you're throwing the ball to the screen. I mean, do the math on how difficult this is. Absolutely. And it's not something you can just enact in a day or just try it. You're not going to try it in a game for the first time. You're going to trial and error. It's going to have to work for you. It's going to work differently for different pitchers. There's also the thing that a, a, a sinker baller or a changeup artist, you want more drop or lower spin sometimes. That's where the Vaseline or slippery or sweat if you put sticky stuff on the ball, it's actually defeating what you're trying to even do. Yeah. And when the split finger first started, the split finger started to hide spitball. And then they, they figured out that splitting a finger or throwing a, a fork ball had the same effect that a spitball did. So it started off as a disguise, but ended up becoming a special pitch. I got one for you real quick. Tell me about a knuckleball. Why, why is a knuckleball um, so very hard to hit? It's unpredictable. I mean, it, it yeah, the, the hitters, you don't see enough of them to where you can actually predict what a knuckleball is doing. When I was with the Rangers, we tried to develop knuckleballers. You know what the biggest problem was in the minor league? We couldn't find a catcher <laughs> that could catch them. And then you have to commit to it. So the, the, the bottom line is, um, it's called chunking. When, when a hitter has seen enough of a 98 mile an hour spin fastball, his brain will start recognizing and he'll start hitting it. We're in that phase now where the hitters haven't seen enough of it. 
and they're guessing wrong and the pitchers aren't quite in total command and what you're seeing is chaos and all of us are talking about chaos which is just progression in the game it's where the game is going that was bauer's point is that it could be that if you just legalize everything hitters are going to adjust to it they're going to get used to it and then it becomes back to the way it normally is. As long as everybody's on a, le- a level playing field, whatever it is, and you see it enough, hitters will now know I'm going to swing above the pitch because yeah. where I think the pitch is going to be traditionally. I think the great hitters, I call it the Juan Gonzalez syndrome. When Juan first got to the big leagues, he could hit anybody's fastball. Anybody, didn't care who it was. Couldn't hit a slider with a boat pal. So what do you, what do you think he saw for two years? Slider, 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 slider. Well, on slider number 412, whatever it was, 440 to right center, MVP. His brain started figuring out what a slider was and where it went, and he put his bat on it. Hitters will adjust. That, that's a great point. And your point about splitters and spitters, I just want to touch on this because I actually have a video on, of uh, Roger Clemens during his 20 strikeout game spitting on the baseball pretending to like kind of rub it, but clearly just leaving it on there and then throwing a nasty splitter with that. So it was a combination of a splitter and a spitter. And then Pedro talked about Jerry curl, which is slicker to get on the baseball because he's a changeup guy and he wants that lower spin rate yeah. fade. Do you realize the art form involved there? It's, it's, it's beautiful. It's part of a beautiful game. And, and that's why I think when people are arguing, it's great to have the argument. The, the dialogue is friggin' awesome for me right now. But don't point fingers. Look at it for what it is. It's a skilled individual trying to get better at what he, he can do with a better toolkit. That's all it is. And you can be jealous and go wow wow about it. But if, if you got any hair on your rear end, you got to get after it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> that sums it up right there. I think that that is what is... It's frustrated me a little bit because I have fans that just compl- like think everybody does nasty is doing something, whatever. And they don't realize their favorite pitcher growing up, whoever that is. I don't care if it's Greg Maddox, John Smoltz, uh, Nolan Ryan. Uh, they were the pioneers. They're, literally, they're right. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, I, I'm so glad I got a chance to talk to you today because I've been watching. It's good that people are complaining. It's good that people are getting all excited. It's good that people are getting angry because it's discourse that wouldn't exist in a normal day. But it's all good for the game when something is, when the line is in the sand and they actually say, you can't do this, then watch. Everybody will adjust. And in five years, it'll be something else they're complaining about. Exactly. I feel like that line has happened um, for pitchers now to be asked and they're kind of being half honest about it, or at least the pregnant pauses or letting you know what's really going on. I think it, it is now becoming more widespread and they just have to take a lead. I think if, if, if folks like Garrett Cole say, Hey, and the hitters all say, let's not, you know, Hey, pine tar is cool. Other now we're getting a little carried away. And then that's the new line that they're going to draw. Yeah. And, and these kids aren't bad people. They're, they, they don't want to cause issues. They don't want to hurt anybody. They, they don't want to cause the game problems but they also want to be the best they can be. Isn't that the opposite of being a bad person? It's being a good person because you're trying to be the best teammate, the best leader, the best for your family, the best, like it's what everybody should strive to do, which is be the, whatever you can do that isn't going to hurt somebody, kill somebody, kill, hurt yourself um, or be illegal and get you in trouble. You should probably, I mean, like you should consider doing that generally. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, you're, we're in the game to get good, but not at the, at the price of health and, and hurting somebody else. Exactly. Well, thank you for joining me. This has been great. And I, I think Anytime. it's a topic that we, we had to talk about. So it's, it's awesome. And you'll, you'll always get what I have to say. I, you know, I'll clean it up as best I can, but it's because <laughs> I actually, I'll believe in it. Okay. You didn't drop any curse words or anything like that this time. That was cool. I, yeah. My wife just gave me a thumbs up. So I survived another <laughs> session. Another session without using a bad word. Awesome. I so appreciate you. Keep up the good work, man. Thank you. Uh, well, this will go out soon, and um, I appreciate it, man.